Hello everyone and welcome to the Talk Music Podcast. Today is a very special day because we are paying tribute to the life and times of the one and only Ted McKenna. My name is Scott Cowie. I am a musician, a drummer to be exact. And when I was 12 years old, I started going to Ted McKenna for drum lessons um, for a number of years. And after Ted started telling me that he taught at this college, um, I decided that I wanted to go and study there um, and learn music from a bunch of different guys, including Ted. And I was very fortunate to meet a, a group of great people within my class, included a couple of the guys that are joining us today. One of them being Mr. Toy Tin Soldier himself, Joe Gallagher, um, who's played um, with Ted live and has got great experiences with Ted. Another one of our classmates was James Allen, who went on to Front Glass Vegas. Um, and James has got some great stories about Ted. Um, I met James under um, unfortunate circumstances three years ago at Ted's funeral. Hadn't seen him in, a, I'm talking about 20 years. Um, and in a weird sort of way, Ted has brought us back together. And it's been great to, to, to reconnect with James and talk about Ted McKenna, to be exact. Um, also joined by Davy Cowan, who again, similar to Joe, has got good experiences of playing with Ted live, as has our fourth guest within this podcast, the one and only Zal Clemenson, of course, Ted's bandmate within the sensational Alex Harvey band. Um, so it's been an absolute pleasure talking to everyone. It's very raw. It's um, one of these situations where you start talking about Ted and you're laughing about all the times that Ted made you laugh. And then you start getting upset because Ted's no longer here. And then you start just going around this circle. But moreover, this is a very positive episode because we're, we're talking about someone who meant so much to us. Um, I didn't have a format for any one of these interviews. Um, I've recorded over well over 100 podcasts now and interviewing tons of different people. And I always like to have tons of questions and really like to research into their careers. But this is a little bit different. I wanted it just to be, again, very, very raw. And everybody, you know, I was just having a chat and talking about Ted. So with the structure of the episode, you know, sometimes we talk about the same subject matters. So we've edited to the point where, you know, it, it blends into the to the stories pretty well when we stay on point and other times it's quite random and it's just different stories and we go from one extreme and the other uh, one extreme to the other rather and again i'm highlighting the point that this is very raw enough of me talking we're going to go straight to us paying tribute to a man who was as sincere as he was sensational in the words of james allen the coolest kindest and most gifted drummer this country has ever seen this is our tribute to Ted McKenna. You wonder as well with Ted, it's like, where, where did he come from? There's a lot about Ted's life that I don't know, but where did he come from to get? Because I think back to like, the opportunity to say that I think about my dad, I think about like my uncles and all that, right, when they were younger. They, I'd assume they came from a similar, similar kind of background, you know, opportunity wise. And I wonder how Ted got any drums, and I wonder how. How did he end up kind of getting into that? Because I think even to be a musician, it was a different thing to be a musician then than what it is now. It was a different thing for us to be musicians than what it is now. And I was sitting down with my man to say, I had built up to this for weeks and weeks and all that. I need to speak to you, I need to speak to you. Sat down living and I was just like, my man's like, what is it? I was like, I've been playing the guitar. <laughs> my mom was just like my sister's there my mom was like ah oh, for god's sake <laughs> is that all it is and I was like it's just like, see him walk the way down you know what I mean so that, that's how I feel when I was coming up even I I was terrified to tell anybody the first oh. music that I bought I was in a supermarket with my mom and I had to like, sneak away from her to Grab the, buy it, put it in my pocket. So I was pure embarrassed by, it, but I thought maybe I'm just, maybe maybe else is like, maybe I'm just a total yodel. But, uh, but I wondered even Ted then, if when Ted's doing it back then, I don't know. If, well, he, he um, <clears throat> big, he got into it with the Beatles. Um, because I can remember when I went to him for lessons, the Beatles anthology. Um, I do, I don't know if you remember in the mid nineties, the big kind of docu series in the Beatles. I do, I do, I. Do. Um, so. <clears throat> Obviously, he experienced it firsthand, and he says like the first track he can remember hearing was "Please Please Me," and he wanted to play the drums, and you know, got more into it, and then Buddy Rich being a huge influence. 
his cousin Hugh McKenna, who's also sadly no longer with us. He was a keys player in the Harvey band, as you might well know. And so they were like playing bands really early doors and things developed. And I think, well, there were so many, so much more opportunities to perform than even there was when, you know, when you and I were, were, were starting out back at that point in time. But again, I always looked in the, in the 90s, or early 2000s or whatever, I, I used to always kind of envy what it was like in the 60s, but God, you look at the, the, the bands in the 90s, obviously, you know, a, a, Oasis having such a gigantic impact culturally. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I love Oasis and I thought they were great at the time, but I always was thinking, oh, it's, it's, not, it's not as good as the Beatles, was it? But again, you, you're just kind of, how much would you, you, you know, you'd, you'd long to have a few more bands from, from that particular time as well. Um, even if you make a record, you know, it's like, it, it was even a bit more complicated when we started it to make, if you want to make a demo, you might make a thing. It was a bit more complicated. But then, back then as well, you know, it's, you can't, yeah, it, it, was, it was probably a bit more difficult, I think, to actually be able to, you know, if, like anything, like whether it's a record or whether it was like a, you know, if you're wanting to make a short film or something like that, you, wasn't, you couldn't just like kind of, you know, get the iPhone out and do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I don't imagine everybody, and when you're with Ted Junger, I don't imagine everybody that's like, you know, his family and all that's like, oh, you should try and go, go and be a musician, go and be a. Yeah. I don't imagine that's the case. So I guess maybe it was like Ted, maybe it was. Maybe it was just, you know, playing balls and stuff like that. Maybe that's what it was, you know, maybe playing balls and Dane Goodman Glasgow and all that and doing all that kind of thing. And, and it's maybe grew a fade there. But I wonder oh, how they actually first, you know. I know it's, it's interesting because um, he used to tell me that he'd played, he told me this when I was like super young, so I didn't really appreciate it. And I obviously appreciate it much more now. He did a gig in Wiffler where... Robert Plant and John Borm's band, like they were on the same bill, a gig in Wifflet at Yon Co Bridge, um, or near near here. Um, and it was just amazing. Like him and Borm put the kit together, like you know, made made a double kit. And he's like, oh yeah. So he'd, he'd like John Borm showed showed Ted how to spin a stick, and oh, yeah. Ted showed me how to spin a stick. So I kind of <laughs> feel like I'm kind of that's the closest I'll get to Led Zeppelin, James. You know. The experience um, of Ted would have been back in the 60s when we kind of kicked off in the respective parts of West of Scotland when I was playing at school with a band called the Bow Weevils. And um, we put together a school band and we used to tour about local area playing church halls and, uh, yeah, you know, the community centres and things like that. And out in Coat Bridge, which is outside Glasgow, Ted and his cousin Hugh had started a band called Rare Breed. Um, and the music was all very similar. Everybody was trying to play black music, black soul music. Everybody was trying to be as soulful and as good as James Brown and, you know, The Temptations and so on. But um, so the first time I came across Ted was probably, I would say, at Airbury Town Hall or Cobridge Town Hall when we were on the same bill. Um, they would have been on maybe before, and then the Bo Weevils came on. So that was the first indication that I that I had of um, these musicians who, at that time, sounded really pretty, pretty good. You know, I mean, kids. I say, well, we were kids, so we were learning. We were trying to emulate our heroes. We were trying to, you know, make a make a go of it. But um, I remember being on the side of the stage at Airdrie Town Hall and watching Rare Breed. And I thought, these guys are, you know, these, you know, they were slick, they were professional, they had an attitude. And um, but what stood out for me was was the fact that they had a great drummer, <laughs> a guy that really could play that kind of black American feel and that groove. And I thought, yeah, this guy's this guy's tasty. And then we kind of you know, we kind of drifted away and, and wandered on our careers and that on that sort of path until until around about the late, I don't know if it was 69 or 70, obviously when Teargas were looking for a new drummer, our previous drummer, Willie from Aberdeen, had decided to go and join Berserk Crocodile of all bands who, who boasted Hamish Stewart as their singer at the time. So he chose to go that way and we said, right, we need a new drummer. So, of course, immediately we thought, this guy, Ted McKenna, he's been about and he's, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
So we were downstairs in the electric garden. We'd set up a rehearsal, uh, an, like a uh, an audition. So Ted came in, set his kit up, had a bash about, and it was just, it was like instant, you know. It was, for me, it was like, yeah, this is this is the guy for the job, you know, and it was it was done and dusted right there. And then after the first four bars almost, you know. When you, you played with this guy for decades, <clears throat> I've, I've seen him on the stage play so many times. Uh, I've actually been on the stage room because I I played the drums on something and he sang an, <laughs> an, a song one night, but never had the experience of playing an instrument out front with this force of nature right behind you playing the drums. Yeah. Explain what that. Explain to me what that was like. Well, I mean, any any musician who's not a drummer or any musician who relies, you know, as a rock band, let's say, any kind of rock band type drummer or uh, type of band. The first thing, the first thing I always want to rely on is the rhythm section. Is this guy holding it together? Can he play in time? Can he play a drum break and come out the other end without stumbling over? And for me, I could just sit in front. I could sit anywhere. I could wander about the stage, and I just heard Ted's drums going, "Yeah, there's the, there's the beat, there's the beat, there's the beat. That's what you want to play to." And I just went, "Yeah, I can." And for a musician, a guitar player in particular, to be able to just sit on that kind of precision you know that you can rely on that that for me became it became a kind of trademark of the, the rhythm section that eventually became the sensation you know with Chris Glenn it became that sort of rhythm section that that, that um that drove the sab drove sab and and just allowed us to just allowed it allowed you a, a, a freedom a peace of mind that you know when you go off in the flyer and you stop talking about you know, improvising, doing stuff like that. You can go right off on a real tangent and you know that that drummer, Ted in particular, is just going to hold on to it and come back out the other end and go, yeah, a big smile on your face. And that for me was, you know, it was like it was like made in heaven, you know. Do you feel like you raised your game? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because when I stopped playing for a few, many, many years, I kind of semi-retired and I went into a bit of isolation and it was Ted... When I got back into, when I moved back from England to Scotland, back to Glasgow, the first person that got in touch with me was Ted. He says, "I've got a, I've got a, I've got a rehearsal room down at um, the studio down in Kelvin Bridge. Was it the big church? Can you remember it, Scott? The big recording studio. Um, I know the one you're right, talking Brian about. Young's, Brian Young's studio. Right. Okay. Um, anyway, he had a rehearsal room down there, Ted, that he had set up, and and he says, "Look, I know you haven't played for a while. Just come down, bring your guitar, plug it in." Just the two of us, and just says, "It's just you know, let's see, let's see what comes out of it, let's see where it goes," and that kind of was the catalyst, really, for getting me back into putting together various kind of other musicians. Alan Thompson was one of the first bass player. Alan was very, well, again, one of my most favourite musicians of all time, and we had a little fusion jazz fusion trio thing going for a bit. And of course, that was right up our street. We all wanted to be, you know, like Jeff Beck and John McLaughlin and, and do all that stuff. And it was really quite sweet to play. And then that kind of blossomed into what Ted had an idea called the Party Boys, which brought in other musicians, sort of, um, you know, Deppin musicians that could step in, a little guest list of people who came to sing and play. Uh, and of course, as that gained a little more kind of notoriety, People started to say, "Well, hang on, where's where's Sab? Why don't you reform Sab? You know, why don't you get?" And then, of course, Chris and Hugh were eventually brought back in until we we kind of put Sab back together. You know, the idea that he moved into teaching and passing on the knowledge he had, um, I really admired him for that when he went to the, to work at the college, the college that you were at, in fact. You know, so moving into that whole area and expanding his expanding his, his sort of portfolio in a way in terms of saying, right, okay, I'm not playing drums today, but I'll go into college and teach kids about the music business or I'll tell them, give them some anecdotes and, you know, do this, don't do that. And um, so passing on his wisdom, it just it, it didn't surprise me because, as I said earlier on, Ted, had, he was as, as wise as you, could, as you could be, you know, and he had this, he had this great depth of... of mm. You know, a kind of a kind of an enlightenment that he, he felt he felt obliged in a way to pass on to others to younger kids. And, you know, for a while you would learn what to say to get them off on it on some rock and roll story. Ted, did you ever meet? You know, so, oh, did I meet? And then he would go on this. He would go on about ten stories, and it, it just it, he was a delight. I loved him. And you, I mean, I know you were you were 
you were friends, like, like friends with him, you meet up and all that. I had a, I had a slightly different relationship with him when I left. Um, he would keep in touch and he would show up places. Like he would, he would, he would see that you were playing somewhere and he would just show up, just head. Mm. And uh, and he was always, he was always really encouraging. Just, just the, I mean, the best. Whenever I think of him, and I think everybody, I mean, even doing it now, you just smile. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because the stories and the and the and the and the what's the word I'm looking for? The he sort of he gave off inspiration. He made you feel that you could that you could do it. You know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, 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 he's he's quite indescribable because, to me, he was this. He became this legendary figure in my head because I really got, I really heavily got into Alex Harvey after that, and and uh, and to put him in there, it was a, it was a bit. I, I'm glad there was a wee bit of distance between us because I don't think I would ever have been able to process the fact that, you know, the. Uh, the, the drummer of the Alex Harvey band was like coming out of my house for a cup of tea. That would have just that would have just mm-hmm. fucked me up. <laughs> I think it kind of had everything. It had everything. Um, it had the stories of the experience, right? That you're going to respect when you know you're wondering how does this thing go? You know, what's it like? Kind of thing when the the, the real deal stuff. He he's done all the the real thing. You know. Um, it had quite a. I don't. Know, it's quite a hard thing to explain. I think a lot of people might think that sounds crazy. He quite a beautiful face. I think when he was speaking, he was quite a easy, to, easy on that. Easy this when he's telling the stories, daily thing. It's just a. a you know, it's quite, and it does the way face. Quite a beautiful face. It was kind of like on the inside. It kind of mirrored. There and everything just flowed, you know. It had no, um, I think also because that he had he it was the real deal, he'd done that thing. There was sort of a there wasn't a he was quite a relaxed guy, I think, for that. I remember Ted saying this about James long before the kind of the world knew it, um, and Las Vegas became so big. I think I'd said, I'd said to him. Oh, this guy James Allen. I mean, there's just something about him. And Ted says, "Yeah, I mean, he takes it all in." That's what do you mean? Well, you know, there's a lot of singers. Are, they're very loud, and they walk into a room. They're really loud, but but James is really quiet, and he just sits and he just observes it all. He, he takes it all in, and 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 that's why he'll be a brilliant lyricist. And fuck, he predicted the future, which is Ted. Mm-hmm. Ted had just been around and he just knew it. And he, he knew, knew James. He, he, he just, he, he, he recognised it before. I mean, Campbell Owen did as well. But Ted had just, he observed the observer and mm. he was just correct about so yeah, many things. My God, was that guy proud of you? Oh, like, he was totally, totally proud of you, James. But one thing that was funny and it kind of sums Ted up, he would always go on about the songs but get song titles mixed up. And he's, he's given it the... I mean, uh, James, I mean, that, <clears throat> the daddy with the, the cheating heart song, brilliant, <laughs> you know? And just uh, I love that, I love that. Yeah. And I just, after 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 a while, I just thought, I just, <clears throat> yeah, that one's a cracker, Ted, that one's a, as a, as a tribute to Ted, are you going to play um, the daddy with the cheating heart song? <laughs> Do you know what, I think that, I meant to say before, I think that's so sweet. His best work that I've seen him playing, um, Funny enough, was actually with a band he was in quite briefly. Actually, it was the Rum Boogie Orchestra, and he was playing a wee gig in Byers Road and it had Alan Thompson on bass, Alan right. Brown on guitar, yep. Violet Layton, mm-hmm. and um, he invited me along. And it was actually me and my wife Joanne's first date. <laughs> we went along to the gig. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. So um, we went along to I can't remember the name of the venue. It was in Byers Road. I think it's actually closed now. So I went along to see it, not knowing what I was in for. I knew it was a sort of blues type thing. But when I went to see it, I was blown away because it was that sort of Buddy Rich, big band, swing, boogie woogie stuff. And I was like, wow, you know, I've seen him doing the rock stuff. I saw him playing with Michael Schenker and things like that. And I've seen him playing with Paul Rose um, and obviously Band of Friends. But seeing him doing this kind of Buddy Rich stuff, you're like, this guy is primarily known as a rock drummer. 
but he's doing this body rich stuff and a lot of this kind of Latin, he was throwing a lot of Latin things into his grooves as well and I was like, this is just phenomenal. And um, I've seen him at a few gigs where I've been with guitarists and things like that, we've been along to see him playing and at the end of the gig they all say the same thing, I could not keep my eyes off Ted McKenna the whole night. Purely because he was so energetic when he played, he pulled the wackiest faces when he played. When he dropped a stick, he would still keep the groove going and just lean over and pick another stick up and he would make some sort of funny remark about it and just carried on. He was just like the ultimate professional. It was quite it was quite incredible. So we had done I remember the songs. I, I remember I, I remember a few of them. We'd done doubt uh, was it a Caroline status quo? Right. Uh, or down down, I say I remember them. We done high. I think it was Highway to Hell. We done. We yeah, done remember, yeah, we did. Remember we that? Done yeah. A few things. Anyway, I sort of. So I came along that day. We rehearsed, and then I think we just went straight over to the Buff Club, and sort of done it. And as we were coming off, he sort of grabbed me by the arm, and he 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 just said, "Listen, th- thanks very much." He said. Um, you know, I don't, I don't say, I don't say this lightly, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not bullshit, and this is actually what he said to me. He said, um, "I don't say this lightly, but um, it was great being up there with you, and some of the stuff that you do, and the way that you hold the audience reminds me so much of Alex." And I fucking, I nearly, I nearly sort of went into some sort of, I was, I was sort of thinking, did I imagine that? But that's what he said to me. And I never told anybody because I thought, nah, nobody will ever believe that. But that's what he said to me. It reminds me of Alex. And I thought, well, fuck me. You know, I must be I must be doing something. Um, and he kind of is, he's kind of everywhere. He's, mm-hmm. He comes up a lot. Have you noticed that? He comes up loads. He's, he comes he's, up he's, all the time. People talk about things and, and they go, oh, and you go, fuck, I, I don't know. I, I Ted done that or, or Ted played on that. or you, He comes up. All the time, his fingerprints are everywhere. You know, his fingerprints are everywhere from the from the albums that he's played on to the marks that, that he's left. And I'm sure you're the same. Every you talked about that amazing compliment that he gave you. I think well, I I've only ever told you really. I've told my my wife and a few my family and stuff. But I've, but 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 I think everybody else would think I was talking rubbish. But that's genuinely what he said to me. No, I, I listen. I believe you because um, Ted, anything, any compliment that Ted gave any one of us. We remember, and we remember it so vividly because it meant so much. You know, it wasn't like, and I, I, I and want to show the appropriate respect to, to everybody because that's what Ted would have done. Like somebody, you're an amazing singer, mate. That you know, it was just like you, you get that, and that's that's great. And and God love everybody for 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 taking their time out to do that. But let's not forget, see when he's coming off stage, how many. Students, how many people at that gig would have been crowded around Ted, wanting to be the person that spoke to Ted, and he's he's pushing that to one side because he's wanting to grab you by the arm and give you that time, and that and that that's what does that say about him? Well, it's only in height. It's only as you get older you realize yes, that Ted always and he and he used to make the point that he listened to the song when he was playing the drum track when he was recording. He listened to the lyric. He listened to what the singer was doing and where the dynamics of the song were, where he should stop, start, play something, come in, you know. He 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 analyzed the song and 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 played the song rather than just sitting bashing a drum kit and hoping that it might work. He 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 had this great sensibility to 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 to, to be able to do that. And I think it I think it, it, it improved Every one of us, as we worked more and more with Alex, we became much, much more adept at playing more like an orchestra than playing like a rock band, where you had real dynamics and you had real incident and you had the right moments of, of tension. And, um, and of course, that's very much what people enjoy about Saab's music, I think. Um, it, just, it just seemed to ooze class about him. I think that the class is probably the key word there. It was just a class act above everybody else. Um. Yeah, it was just somebody that I always. I mean, I'm a keyboard player, as you know, Scott, and I've I've always had a wee passion for the drums. So, just for me, Ted was just the ultimate, ultimate musician. Not even just drummer, the ultimate musician. He goes, 
So <clears throat> you you you're maybe wondering why I, I don't live in a big mansion after all the, the success that I've had, and I didn't want to say <laughs> don't want to say maybe cross my mind. But he said, um, you know, there's 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 a lot of my, from my experiences, there's a lot of people in this business that will try and rip you off and they'll try and take everything from you, and, and always remember that. I went, all right, okay, that that's good advice. And he, and he said. And also, three wives and a lot of cocaine didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then, decades went by. My dad's passed away a couple of years ago. I didn't tell my dad that. I'm a grown man, and I thought I, I can't tell my dad that because it's like, how was the drum lesson, son? Ted told me not to. Ted told me not to not to take cocaine. <laughs> James, James, I was fourteen. I was fourteen at the time. Unbelievable. Aye, and you know what? It's you're ready, you're ready. Just going through these little routines that you had. Ted and I used to do a whole routine where we stuffed ourselves, uh, stuffed our, our clothes full of uh, full of bed linen, so the two of us looked enormously fat. And uh, we'd be in a, like, a bedroom on tour somewhere, and we just the two of us would bounce around the room like a couple of Michelin men, bouncing into each other and screaming and singing because everybody was just in hoots of laughter. But so he was. He was up for any kind of humour, any kind of, you know, any chance that that you had to lighten the mood and, and create a bit of create a bit of a bit of nonsense. He was he was absolutely the ringleader. He's you know, when he passed, there was this like, well, he was technically a brilliant player, but there was just something it was much more than he's well, drawing that. It was much more than him being a great all round musician as well, as you said. Mm-hmm. His personality was as big has his, has his talent for, for music. And because, mm-hmm. as you said, he had so much time for everybody, that was really, really apparent when it came to the, the how busy the funeral was, when it came to how emotional everyone was being in their posts and, and social media as a mm-hmm. result of that. Everybody yeah. was, was being so genuine. Everybody was taking their time to express what they felt about him because he'd spent so much time giving everything to everyone. Everybody, yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you've you've kind of said it there as well, Scott. There's a lot of musicians out there that it's all ego. It's all about them. When they play, it's all about them. And then they go off stage, they don't spend time with the fans, they don't sign autographs, or they charge people for signing an autograph. Ted would just come off stage and talk to you as if he was one of your best pals. And I don't normally do posts like that, but I felt utterly compelled to do it because he... um. Because because of that, because of what he said to me, because he took, fuck it, I mean, thirty seconds out of his life to make me feel a hundred foot tall, um, and I just felt the least that I could do was just tell the world how, or my world, the world in which people that I know are in, tell them how great he was, and he really was. He was as great, and he was as great as everybody says he was. And the thing that I noticed about that morning was when I was on social media, every drummer and musician that I had ever known, that I've ever known who I'm in contact with, um, and their friends who were musicians and would tag them in posts, all of them to, I don't think, with, without fail, I think every single one of them had respect and admiration for Ted. And, 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 and I don't think we're being, I don't think we're being over the top when we say that he is actually one of the greatest drummers that ever lived and one of the greatest bands that ever were in tear gas or the Alex Harvey band, because that was a fucking force of nature. Mm-hmm. Absolute force of nature. And then, you know, Rory Gallagher and and and, 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 and Gary Moore and, and Michael Schenker and Momak and Momak aren't all wrong either. You know? The fact that you've, you know, you've been around the world, released a lot of records, had hits and done the whole thing, but when you posted up saying that when Ted McKenna, after all that, asked you for a cup of tea, it meant the world to you. I mean, what does that say about him? But it's somebody who that you, because nothing really changes. It's like when you're, I think there's some things that when you're, when, when you, that's the way it should be. When you see it in a certain light, like when you're younger, a lot of the times it really is quite hard to shake that, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and, the, and um, it's so that then when it, when, when I, when he did say, do I get a cup of tea? Then I was just like, you know what? The guy, the guy's happy to be in, in my company and he's no thinking, 
where else should we where else would a either rather be or need to be or it's quite I, I know it sounds like such a basic thing and it's like what's 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 so out of the ordinary about that. There was just something that touched me about it though and um I he's in some ways I never knew the the time that it would be something that would that I'd be talking about, like, you know, like this. But maybe a part of me did not. You know, when I really think about it, I did know it was special and I did know that um, there's a part of me that did not. You know what I mean? It's both, I think. Um, and I think that it's... Uh, it, with this kind of thing, it's amazing because it makes me think about... It makes me think about how, you know, uh, how great Ted is. But it also makes me it makes me feel really good because you've um, you've listened, you've looked, and you've he's showed you the way the, the way you should be, and you understand that, and then you can actually continue that. That's what you that's what you're doing, and I think both is just important to me. You know what what Ted does, and then what you're doing there. It's like uh, the both things make me feel like oh, this is. That's uh, inspiring, and it, it reminds you um, what's important, kind of thing, you know. And um, obviously, the relationship you, you had with Ted was a much uh, closer one, and and I think that's uh, that touches me. That that sort of does because you you sort of um, been put together by kind of a destiny or whatever, you know. There's no family or anything like that, but yes, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, that's I feel the same about a lot of things in life. Well, it's the the friendships that we've got, and it's the ones that you that you earn, and that other side of it, they both earn it rather than the title of uncle, da, ma, right, sister. Right. Don't you speak to me like that? I'm your sister or something, you know. Mm-hmm. But it's, and in such a way that you're a young guy who's who's got other things going on in his life. You've got other things going on here. You've got other things. You'll be like, you know, and and you you put them here because these things are important and these things are important. But it's. But it's uh, it's it doesn't happen all the time. But you're doing it, and um, I think the fact that you're doing it, it's you don't even probably think about it. But it's the same thing. Well, when you're doing this, it makes everybody think how great he is as well, because that kind of touched the, that thing that he's like um, uh, influenced you away. It's like it, it keeps rolling on again. But it's, it's great. I think it's really great. I love this. It always comes yeah. back to me. That that same thought comes back to me. What a dreadful waste of an of a fantastic man, a fantastically talented musician, and his life was just stopped like that, you know. I spoke to him a few days before he went into hospital for the operation that he was going to have, the, 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 the hernia operation, and it was all routine. He says, yeah, it's just another one of these hernias I'll... And I says, okay, I'll give you, I'll have a chat with you when you come out, sort of thing. And the Saturday morning after his operation, I got a message from a friend, a text message to say, um, Ted, Ted, Ted died last night. And I looked at it and I looked and I thought, I thought, the first thing I went, who's Ted? I said, who's Ted? Ted, Ted, Ted's died. Who, who's, what, who's Ted? And then it suddenly dawned on me. And I looked at my partner, Rachel, at the time, and I went, our Ted, and it was like, I just, you know, we just, I was dumbstruck, I was dumbstruck. Yeah, I mean, the world is a, a far poorer place without him, um, and just such a great career as well, mm. and just trying to, to to find, if possible, some sort of positive, and uh, what you're outlining there is a hugely negative story for, for, for us all, um, is that when he, when he, um, when he passed, he was mm. he would he'd been touring and he was pl- playing the best he'd ever played, Absolutely. um and, and at the very very top. If there's a, a positive to take, 
from yeah, that. I mean, at the funeral, you know, I mean, I'm not a, you know, a, <laughs> nobody likes a funeral. I don't mean it like that, but, you know, the idea of, and when I was, I just couldn't believe the amount of people that turned up for Ted's funeral. It was, you know, it was like, it, it, it was like a requiem for a movie star, you know, or a, or a television star or a person, you know, a real, a real um, prominent personality. And of course, you know, as, as uh, over the years when Ted and I have drifted apart and, and our careers went different ways, um, I've, I've, I, I took a much more of a back seat and, and, and isolated myself a lot more. But Ted constantly kept in touch with people. He constantly looked to bring in new ideas or start a new project or I want to get something off the ground. I want to be playing. You know, I, I, it was just, I want to play. I don't, you know, he needed to play. It was in his blood. It was in his... It was in his DNA that he had to sit and play music and play drums and be part of something. We're the old school guys that have done it all. <laughs> it's like, it's like they've done it, man. You know, it's like, but he is just like, he's just happy to see. It's not about the, or oh, him picking apart the thing you're doing and really admire. It's not. He, he just wants to see you doing all right, whether it's on a stage or whether it's, that that's 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 what he cares about. And that that's what it's, it's not about the getting the details of it. He's just like, is it is it what made for that guy? Brilliant. That, that's and that's the way it should be. You know what I mean? So, oh, I know, I know, I know. And it's thanks for for asking me to um, have a chat because it's it's uh, it's such a it's nice to sit and chat about these kind of things. You know. Uh, Great guy, great face, beautiful face, beautiful soul, uh, real deal. The real deal, yeah, the real deal, and an absolute class act. And the word class keeps getting brought up the more we discuss I believe he's a great musicologist, a great conversationalist, and there was never a dull moment when he was around. I would imagine he's just, he would just be the absolute perfect person to have on tour, not, of course, just for the phenomenal playing and everything that he brought to the table musically, but just as a person. And I think that that's... <sighs> To your point, I don't think there, there wouldn't have been anywhere near as many people at his funeral. There wouldn't have been these types of things getting put together by by ourselves, these podcasts, if it, if, mm. if the how good he was as a person didn't match the ability, you know, because there's some people that are just like, well, you know, he was this, that, and the next thing. I can't deny that he was a really good musician. However, you know, there, there may be some negative context, but with, with Ted, it's such overwhelming positivity. And his yeah. fingerprints are everywhere about how, how much that he, he meant to us all personally. Well, that's, I couldn't have put it better myself. That is the legacy that the man has. And that just shows you the life that he had and the life that he created, not just for himself, but for many, many other people.